Hey everyone, this is Haley from Cartooners, bringing you another Star vs. The Force of Evil Theory video. Today's video is about Queen Eclipsa, so enjoy! Eclipsa has always been the enigma of the Butterfly family. With each Queen of Muni has their own motif and chapter in the Book of Spells, Eclipsa is unique in that she seems to have an entire domain as her motif, that of the darkness. In other words, while the other queens occupy slices of the Realm of Light, Eclipsa, it seems, is the exclusive occupant of this diametric space. This is, of course, as far as we're aware of in the canon of the show. We know that all the chapters in the family spellbook, only Eclipsa has the connotation of being forbidden, requiring Glossaric to unlock it. Given the intrigue surrounding the character, Eclipsa's re-emergence in the narrative raises some questions about where Star and the series are heading. Since the show's inception, we've seen that the forces of evil are not such a simple thing to place. What initially was a struggle for power between good, humans, and evil monsters was shown to be much more complex. Muni is a kingdom rife with inequality, with leaders who care about their subjects, but at the same time view them as easily suggestible and lesser than themselves. Monsters, likewise, are not homogenous and suffering from poverty, under the table politicking, and disorder. Over the series, the evil has taken many forms, from Ludo's attempt to steal the wand, to Toffee's manipulation and destruction of many of the characters. Amid all of the interpersonal conflict, though, there's been another steady narrative going on. Star herself has been changing throughout the series. One thing to recall is that Star was originally sent to Earth so that she'd be better trained to be a queen. Coming to Earth was a compromise she made so she wouldn't be sent to St. Olga's. Interpreted this way, a lot of the series is geared towards Star becoming more and more of someone who deserves to be Queen of Muni. From being able to fight and defend her kingdom, to being able to deal with other people in a mature and diplomatic way, Star's experiences are honing her to be a better person and a better queen, and the series is documenting that. Something that is generally agreed upon is that Star is maturing. She's made many personal sacrifices for the things she cares about, destroying her one, not once but twice, risking her life, leaving her life on Earth in order to protect her friends and her kingdom. After the Battle for Muni mini-movie, there is seemingly little else to prevent Star from being considered a true queen. In Queen Moon's words, Star wasn't just a happy child anymore. She has become significantly stronger, more patient, more selfless, and more responsible than when she was first introduced. At the same time, it appears as though the evil she's supposed to be against is reformed, or vanquished, marked by Ludo's commitment to reflection and Toffee's apparent destruction. It's striking that at the end of the battle for Muni, it showed that Eclipse's crystal was being fractured, but her appearance as a potential threat to the main characters might be subtler than those for the previous antagonist. Now let's talk about what Eclipsa represents. Eclipsa made her first appearance in Into the Wand, on her tapestry from Star's memory of the Grammar Room, and her status as a member of the family was until then kept hidden from Star, as we learn in Star and Marco's Guide to Mastering Every Dimension. The Butterfly family likely felt that Eclipse's very existence was too dangerous for Star to know about at this point in her life. Later, in Page Turner, the Magic High Commission reacts with much fear that Star is reading Eclipse's chapter in the book. But then, when we finally see the end of the episode, she appeared unaffected by the new information presented to her. In the end, all her reading amounted to Star using only one spell, the All-Seeing Eye, a spell meant to watch someone else without their knowing. From the way the older characters reacted to Star's reading Eclipse's chapter, we had expected spells on murder, death, and in general of a much darker nature. It's worth noting then, why Surveillance spell is up there among those side of, say, Eclipse's spell to kill the unkillable monster. It may very well be that this show is framing things like consent, choice, and non-violence as important values that need to be upheld, and this puts in a clear perspective why Eclipse is so feared in the first place. A persistent theme in the narratives of Eclipsa is simply her person. Eclipsa isn't often viewed by the characters as a previous queen of Muni or a great and powerful wielder of magic in so much as she's simply Eclipsa. In the show, her name needs no introduction, as she herself requires no qualifiers. When characters mention her, all the weight of her name carries speaks for itself, and the listeners react with corresponding awe and horror. And we gather then, based on context, all these other factors about her. In Into the Wand, we recognize her as a previous queen because of her presence in the grammar room. In Baby and Page Turner, we get a glimpse of just how powerful Eclipse's magic is and the fear she brings with her. Yet we've seen similarly powerful magic users before. Romulus was able to contain her, and based on her assessment, Star's power could rival Eclipse's own, but they don't elicit the kind of fear that invoking Eclipse's name does. Something unique to Eclipse, then, 
is a certain self-orientedness we don't see in other queens, which couple with her power makes her both unpredictable and terrifying. For instance, while the other tapestries in the grammar room, both from Into the Wand and the guidebook, showcase previous queens' immunity in terms of their motif, a great act they did for the kingdom, or something they stood for, Eclipse's entry is very personal. Eclipse a queen of Muni to a Mumin king was wed, but took a monster for her love and away from Muni fled. Unlike those other queens' tapestries, Eclipse's tapestry is very focused on her private life. Even the image on the tapestry captures an unqueenly aspect of her, her being held by a large demon, wearing a ring on his finger. From the episode Moon the Undaunted, we know that the tapestries don't capture the moments in the exact way they happened. Even Moon's blasting off of Toffee's finger was stylized for the tapestry. This highlights the idea that the representations captured are great and decisive moments in the lives of the queens. For Moon, it was being able to intimidate the unkillable monsters and preventing them from attacking the kingdom. That act not only saved Muni, but cemented her role as a strong and capable queen, earning her authority in the eyes of much older parties. In that way, Moon's moment had large and personal scale implications worth recording. If Eclipse's decisive moment was her choosing personal interests, that is, her demon love, over her kingdom, then the large-scale implication is apparent. Muni's queen had left, and her daughter, or the next butterfly in line would be queen. On a personal level, it tells us a lot about Eclipsa. She's not only aware of her own power, but she's also very confident about it. Her identity isn't tied to being a queen or to Muni. Glossark himself said that the only queen who had never bothered him with questions was Eclipsa. Her character has a large focus on interiority, and it's likely she made a lot of her decisions on her own. Eclipse's strong individuality on its own doesn't seem to be dark and evil. That in itself ties in with many of the show's themes about prejudice and making judgment. But the result of this individuality and stubbornness is that a lot of these spells impinge on the lives of others, a common theme linking the spells for power of darkness, force of evil, eternal suffering, blah blah blah, that Star saw in Eclipse's chapter is their disregard of others. When spying on Marco, Star would have rather been on her own, rather than be honest about her feelings, or at least talk to her friends so that things wouldn't have been as awkward. And the use of that power was intoxicating, because she was calling these shots on her own, seemingly detached from the mercy of others, but it didn't respect Marco or Jackie's privacy. The act of killing someone else is the ultimate disregard for their being as an individual, because it likens their life as something worth much less than the life of the killer. Toffee's attempted erasure of Star and Glosser particularly in the context of means to an end, exemplifies that. The reason Eclipse's chapter and dark magic in general may be so dangerous is its promotion of this very self-oriented worldview, which is definitely not something to be supported in a queen who is to be responsible for many individuals. The theme of singularity in Eclipsa is even more apparent now, as she appears to be the last of her generation of butterflies, being Star's ninth great grandmother. She's been encased in her crystal, alone for hundreds of years. Now that she's returning, the carefully crafted narrative that things were always in a certain way, or that a princess always had to follow certain steps before coming queen, could change drastically. Looking at the now established narrative, that good queens are supposed to sacrifice for their kingdom and their loved one, we see no character exemplify this better than Queen Moon. In the rare occasions we see Moon in the first two seasons, she was worried over Star but was very torn about telling her the truth of what was going on. Even in the battle for Muni, she thought that she could continue letting Star believe that the most things were still okay, and that she had a plan and a solution, when in fact, she was just as clueless about what to do with Star. Moon wanted to spare even River the suffering and anxiety of the wild magic climate caused by Toffee's influence and left without telling him the details of her journey. Even without such an urgent concern though, River tells Marco in Marco and the King that he's used to being left alone on his own, not knowing about Moon's whereabouts where she leaves on business. This sort of thinking applies to the people Moon rules as well. In Face the Music, she makes it a point to remind Star that Mewmans wanted to believe in perfect princesses instead of knowing the truth. But when we look at the episode, the Mewmans were fine with Star's song until they realized they were being lied to. It wasn't so much that they couldn't handle the truth, as that they felt disrespected. Because when Ludo does take over the kingdom in King Ludo, the Mewmans aren't easily swayed fools. They reject his reign in both explicit and subtle ways. Even under the threat of violence, they can't give themselves to this new king, fully knowing that the old king wasn't perfect himself. In other words, the climate for princesses and queens of Muni now is one of self-sacrifice, of working oneself to exhaustion without letting those around you know. And the way it's being exercised, it's not healthy. This attitude, taken into excess, has not only harmed those around Moon, but Moon herself. 
who feels she can't confide anymore in anyone and is incredibly stressed about it. Queens not only represent their kingdoms, they are themselves individuals. In this respect, both Eclipsa and Moon's philosophies are not in themselves wrong, but a balance must be reached. When Moon made use of Eclipsa's spell, she officially became queen. It was more than just a show of strength, because it was then that she stopped the fighting from being overwhelming with just pleasing everyone. It was the act of an individual, and it earned their respect. It's interesting that Moon's tapestry doesn't depict the darkness that had begun to envelop her hands after she cast a spell that blasted Toffee's finger off. It could be that by and large, Moon got what she wanted from her transaction with Eclipsa, and that her intention had only been to warn and to intimidate. But years later, when Toffee took Star away from her, we got to see those dark veins crawl higher on her skin. It could be that only then did Moon truly feel the desire to see Toffee dead, and in Star's return and destruction of Toffee, Eclipse's crystal cracked because the transaction was complete. Because Moon's identity derives from her being queen, responsible for her kingdom. Even when she's at her lowest, when she has no idea what to do next, she's repelled forward by her sense of responsibility for Star, River, and the Mumins. It's rare that we see her act out of self-interest, and the emotional scene when she and Marco face Toffee was one of them. Viewed in this manner, Eclipse's reintroduction and what she stands for herself isn't inherently harmful, but it can be. When Star comes face to face with Eclipsa, the worry isn't that she'll be taken by dark magic. She's already been exposed to it, and she regretted it immensely. Even so, dark magic is just another form of power, and Star doesn't really feel the need for it. Eclipsa and dark magic's allure is the very temptation that one is powerful enough to do what one wants. Based on what we saw from Eclipsa in the episode Toffee, she doesn't seem angry or violent, but she does seem very self-oriented and impulsive. When unfrozen, her first order of business is a candy bar, and she didn't seem in a rush to get out or to even convince Moon she deserved her freedom. Eclipsa is someone who is certain of her place in the world. From what we've seen of her, it appears she wasn't as interested in power itself as much the enjoyment and freedom it would give her. That's likely why she left her position and her kingdom. This is why it's unlikely her end goal is going to be to get more power or to seize control of the kingdom. She doesn't seem to want responsibility. She wants what she wants when it comes to her, and that is a very appealing way to live. Instead of power for its own sake, she might offer Star something else. Freedom. Star has always been torn between change and tradition. She's searching for her identity and wants to bring that into the way she rules as queen, even though it rivals tradition. And Star has some very valid points in that regard, though she can overstep at times, because she can lack sensitivity or maturity. Moon wasn't as susceptible to Eclipse's offer because she was firmly anchored in that very tradition, which also told her that what was and wasn't acceptable. Star, on the other hand, never felt as though she fit in, and a lot of her life-changing experiences happened off of Muni. If Eclipse introduced any danger into the narrative, aside from the negative externalities of her doing whatever she wanted, it would be how appealing her lifestyle would be for Star, who at this point may feel as though she had already given up so much for Muni and her loved ones. This dilemma will, like most character development, run in the background of a much larger scale events, as is in the tradition of the show, but it will nonetheless shape the episodes to come and the protagonists we end up with. And with that wraps up this theory video, I want to give a huge shout out to the writer of this script, who is Poet of the Piano, you probably remember them, they did a bunch of seniors related uh, scripts last year I believe, and this year too and they finally started helping out again with that and they are just so great at this and they're probably gonna do another star versus one um so i'll just also post their tumblr blog down below which has all their amazing analysis and metas and all that um all the the good stuff that they make and also don't forget to uh subscribe if you have not already because these theories take so much time that if you want to see when we release another one this is definitely the way to do so make sure to click the little bell when you uh, subscribe to get notifications about any future uploads just so you can make sure to see it give it a like uh, you know thumbs up too same thing and write down in the comments below what you thought of this uh, about Eclipsa and what you think she will end up as or what her importance in the series will be overall because I am super excited to learn more about her in the upcoming episodes so I would also like to thank my Patreon supporters as always, they are just amazing people. And I would like to give a huge shout out to Joshua, who became a new Patreon supporter. If you would like a shout out like this, make sure to become a patron. We also have many other cool rewards there for you to check out. So make sure to check it out if you have a chance, if you're feeling inclined to do so. So thank you guys for watching.